Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak at your graduation ceremony today. Really, probably one of the most wonderful honors in my life. And this was a difficult speech for me to write because I wanted to be sure that my remarks would have some impact on your roles as future physicians. So I decided to talk with all of you from my perspective as a patient, a view from the bed, so to speak, as I had a personal experience in dealing with a potentially fatal illness, or one that definitely would have been fatal to me without rapid and appropriate treatment. So at the time, I was 62 years old, and the date was March 17, 2017. And I remember that date really well because it was match day. And I was feeling very well during the festivities, really enjoyed the ceremony, <clears throat> excuse me. And then mid-afternoon, I noted some muscle aches, really no other symptoms, although they kept returning despite analgesics. So that night, there was a dinner program at the Biltmore Hotel in Providence uh, to kick off a weekend symposium at the medical school that was entitled The Patient, the Practitioner, and the Computer. And the theme was how the electronic health record has impacted communication between patients and physicians and might also make physicians less humanistic. So as one of the people who supported the symposium, I was asked to give some opening re remarks, and I took the opportunity of talking about a personal experience that I had had with the electronic health record about five years earlier. So at the time, I was chair of the Department of Medicine at a teaching hospital in New Jersey, and I'd just been diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. I was pretty sick at the time, needed to be urgently admitted to my hospital for chemotherapy. Now, you would think that this diagnosis in and of itself was an anxiety-producing event, but there was another issue and one that gave me even greater concern. This was the week that my hospital was rolling out their electronic health record. <laughs> <clears throat> so it was, a, it was a chaotic time. Everyone was being trained on how to use it. Would I be able to survive? Uh, of course I did. I got all the right medications. There were no errors in my care. I also responded very well to the chemotherapy. I remain cancer-free now, uh, now after almost seven years. <clears throat> so I decided to tell the audience of the conference about one particular experience regarding the hospitalization, because after a discharge, I, of course, decided to go into my hospital record to review my chart. So on my initial history, there was a question. The question was pregnancy. <laughs> and the box checked was patient denies. <laughs> now, that's actually an issue on two levels. The first, you know, I hope, is the obvious one. But the second is that no one ever asked me if I was pregnant. <laughs> and this highlights a potential issue with the electronic health record. I'm going to talk get back to this a little bit later. But now back to March 17, 2017 at the Biltmore. So about 30 minutes after my remarks during the keynote, I started feeling lightheaded, was sweating, a little nauseated, definitely feeling like I was about to pass out, so hurried out of the banquet hall into the lobby. I didn't lose consciousness, but fell to the floor, and I just thought it was some sort of vasovagal response, not sure to what. I think people attending the keynote noticed something was wrong, and a number of the doctors followed me out. So I, I, if you're going to pass out, the best place to do it, by the way, is at a medical conference. <laughs> so my pulse was difficult to palpate, was fast, really no other symptoms. Fire rescue was called after an intervention by Dr. Schiffman, and I was loaded into the ambulance and taken to the ER at Rhode Island Hospital. I, I was feeling fine by that time, still some generalized muscle aches, but really nothing else, no headaches, stiff neck, chest pain, nothing. My only medications were aspirin, and I took Valsartan for hypertension. I'm allergic to kiwi, but I hadn't taken any since 1989. <laughs> uh, no one actually asked me about uh, drug use or sexual activity, probably because they were afraid of what I might say. <laughs> uh, after all, I was a teenager in the late 1960s. I had received my yearly influenza vaccine the previous November, and I had gotten the pneumococcal vaccine as well. So examine the ER, my temp was 99.9, heart rate 101, respirations 14, my blood pressure was 111 over 72. I, we're we're going to just get into it, so we want to be sure you're prepared for residency. <laughs> my pulse ox was 99% on room air, all essentially normal, although my pulse was a little faster than usual. My lungs were clear, nothing abnormal on my exam, my labs were pretty normal too, except my white count was up, about 16,000. Chest x-ray, EKG were normal. The emergency room attending came to see me, indicating there did not seem to be any obvious source of bacterial infection or anything else. 
I told her I still didn't feel quite normal, and after some discussion, she decided to admit me with plans to have me monitored and check uh, my lab studies in the morning. Uh, she said there did not seem to be any reason for administration of antibiotics, so since I'm an infectious disease specialist, I concurred. <laughs> the resident was called to do my history and exam. He, did also, he also did not ask me about drug use or take a sexual history, and I was left on the stretcher in the ER, hooked up to the monitor, wearing my blood pressure cuff that would intermittently inflate and deflate. It was around midnight this time, and I decided to try to fall asleep. About 1.30 in the morning, I awoke and put, to turn my head toward the monitor. My pulse was now 130 beats per minute, and my blood pressure was dangerously low at 75 over 50. Now I was febrile, I'm getting short of breath. The oxygen level of my blood had decreased to 92%. I called for the nurse to get the ER physician. It turned out to be Dr. Rugus. He increased, the, good, yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Rugus. He increased the rate of fluids, ordered a stat CT scan of my chest, abdomen, and pelvis after taking cultures of my blood. Good work, cultures first. He started antibiotics. The CT scan, I, I wouldn't have let him start them without the blood cultures. Though. The CT scan showed a new right lower lobe pneumonia, but was otherwise normal. And after four liters of fluid, my blood pressure was unchanged, still dangerously low. Now I'm sent to the critical care area of the ER where I meet a new group of physicians. The resident places a central line in my right internal jugular vein and adds a drug called norepinephrine to raise my blood pressure. Then I'm set to the ICU because I'm in septic shock. So by the time I reached the ICU at six in the morning, the ICU staff works to get me situated. New labs were drawn my oxygen saturation's dropping, and when my labs returned, I asked my, the nurse for the results. My white count was now 2,600, which is below normal. I remember saying to her, this is not good. <laughs> uh, you know, meaning that my own immune system uh, was being overwhelmed, not doing a great job in helping to control my infection. My other labs were not looking good either. My breathing's becoming more labored. I was placed on high flow oxygen. And I remember saying to my nurse, I thought I was likely going to be intubated and placed on a ventilator. She then said something to me that has stayed with me to this day. She said, Alan, I've been watching people breathe for 27 years, and there's many other things that we can do first. I then got placed on BiPAP to help keep my lungs expanded. Really uncomfortable, by the way. Did the trick. By midday, I'd received nine liters of, of normal saline. My hands were swollen. Norepinephrine was maintaining my blood pressure, but could not be stopped. The Infectious Diseases Service was consulted, probably because I'm a dean, I must have something much more exotic than a simple community-acquired pneumonia. They did not make any changes to my antibiotics, asked me if that was okay with me. I said, that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> so next day, my white count's about 8,100, a lot of bands, my platelets are dropping, again, not good. The residents were in to see me early each day. I now had decreased breath sounds and crackles at the right base on exam of my chest, clear signs of pneumonia. Now, as you all know, I'm an educator, and I suggested that they should check me for something called egophony. And what that is, you put your stethoscope over an area of the lung where there's pneumonia, and you ask the patient to say E, and what the physician hears is a loud A sound through the stethoscope. So I then proceeded to tell them how egophony was discovered. I mean, how did anyone ever figure out when you put a stethoscope on the chest over an area of pneumonia, why do you ask the patient to say E? So whenever questions of this source comes up in the history of medicine, there are three major requirements. A British missionary, <laughs> a far-flung land, and lots of serendipity. So in this case, there was a British missionary named Shibley who in the 1920s was practicing missionary medicine in China. So part of his job consisted of auscultating the chest of patients while they were saying one, two, three. And since the patients were Chinese, the Mandarin dialect for the number one was pronounced E in the province where Shibley was working at that time. So the E turned into an A whenever there was pneumonia. So the residents listened. Uh, nobody ever checked me for agophony. <laughs> and they were probably just thinking about all the other sick patients they needed to see and were ready to move on. During my time in the ICU, many people started coming to see me, and I was very happy when they all stopped by. It certainly was hard to rest. And the weekend was over, my new attending physician said no one except family and my care team was now going to be allowed to come by. I needed to rest. A sign was placed on my door, no visitors except family. Sleeping at night was very difficult. The ICU bed was very uncomfortable. I don't like to take medications, but the resident convinced me to take some Zolpidem, which is Ambien at night. 
and I was sleeping so badly I asked him for the hallucinogenic dose. <laughs> Over the next several days, I started feeling better. The team was able to get me off BiPAP, wean off the norepinephrine. After a week in the ICU, I was transferred to the general medicine unit to complete my antibiotics. Now, a new resident saw me, did her own history. She asked me about drug use and sexual activity. But she was one of our, had been one of our Brown medical students. She knows I would not have liked it if she were not complete. And over the next few days, I began ambulating more, was able to maintain my oxygen saturation. Without supplemental oxygen, I was going to get out of the hospital as quickly as I could. The etiology of my pneumonia and septic shock were actually never determined. However, I'm sure I had pneumococcal sepsis, a classic presentation. So now here comes the reflection part. Uh, I'm going to give you a few, five to be exact. First, getting back to the electronic health record, the hospital chart is not always accurate. So, of course, I looked at my chart again. Seemed to be a few inaccurate dates that got carried over. Seemed to be some copying and pasting. Even in later notes from a week after my admission, some notes indicated that already completed tests were still pending. Or the note from the dietician that I had a cholecystectomy in 1999. As far as I know, I still have my gallbladder. Uh, I did, though, I had a actual, I had a vasectomy in 1999. Well, they're both ectomies, right? Close enough. <clears throat> <clears throat> However, on a positive note, in almost every description of me, I was described as a pleasant 62-year-old gentleman. <laughs> and that made me happy, and I think that was accurate. So the message to all of you is to is to be accurate and complete in the health record and rely on information that you personally take from the patient. Second, and with all due respect to everyone else, and of course acknowledging that the approach to a patient's care is a team effort, the nurses are the most important people in the hospital. They spent the most time with me, gave me great care, especially in the ICU. The nurses are the heart and soul of any hospital. And in addition to spending the most time with me, they ensured that through this difficult experience, I was able to maintain my dignity when everything about being in the hospital involves others taking care of your every need and a loss of dignity. And you're going to learn a lot from the nurses and other members of the healthcare team. Ask them what they think and benefit from their knowledge and expertise. Third is that recovery from a serious illness takes a long time. So a friend of mine is head of critical care at the National Institutes of Health, and he sent me a note during my hospitalization. And he made several important points. The first was that physical rehabilitation is a lot harder than it appears in terms of returning to the original state of activity. And to be honest, I did not think it would take months to feel better, but he was right. I should have known this because even for minor activities in the ICU, I needed assistance. I needed help sitting up in bed and two people to pull me up in bed. And for weeks, almost doing all activities was a strain and quite stressful. His second point was that cognitive abilities take weeks or months to recover. I didn't initially believe that either because I was awake and alert throughout my hospitalization, although most certainly had periods of hypotension and hypoxemia. I would say that I was not back to normal for about three to four months. Fortunately, because I'm a dean, I, I have a job that does not require intact cognition. <laughs> right, Dean Elias? Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> Perhaps I was even better at my job. <laughs> of course, I decided not to do any patient care until I was ready. Wound up doing, not doing my inpatient time that was scheduled in June. Fourth, I want to talk about impact on others. So this was my major concern during my hospitalization and relates to my wife's illness. So about 15 years earlier, she was diagnosed with a disease called idiopathic cerebellar degeneration, which has progressed over the years, leaving her wheelchair dependent. On top of that, she's had multiple strokes over the prior three years, which have made the situation even worse. In fact, before my illness, she had spent a week in the hospital, then eight weeks in rehab after her fourth stroke. And I'm her primary caregiver, and need to spend my first day in the ICU arranging for extended home care for her. And that experience, I think, helped me to understand how hospitalizations can disrupt people's lives to a greater extent than I had previously imagined. And my wife, now my health, was my major concern. And I was worried what might happen to her if I did not survive. It really put things into important perspective for me. Finally, were there any positive aspects to all of this? 
Uh, one was that I was overweight. I wound up losing about 15 pounds. It was really embarrassing to look at my chart and see that my body mass index was elevated and it was in red numbers followed by an exclamation point. <laughs> The other positive aspect relates to my family. As you can imagine, my two major illnesses have had a significant impact on them, but also in some positive ways. Our, our family has always been very close. <clears throat> Excuse me, but in many ways, my illnesses have enhanced our relationships. and enriched our lives. So I'm truly fortunate in this regard. We cannot always say the same for many others whose lives have been devastated, who do not have the emotional support they need in order to recover. Unfortunately, throughout your careers, you'll see many patients who do not have the support, and you need to expand the effort to help them through these life-altering events. So this is my main message to you as you move forward in your careers, enhance the lives of your patients. This may happen at the bench, the bedside, in the community, or through advocacy, or maybe through all of these and more. Your patients will be the better for it. Well, that's all I have to say, and hope this summary of my experiences and reflections were useful. Remember, I will always think of each of you as one of my students, no matter where life takes you. My best to everyone. Thank you.